Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Monica doesn't bite, you guys. Everybody makes Monica sit by herself. <laughs> she took a knife and she carved her name in it and everything. All right. Just to be clear, Jeff, we'll start back at good morning. <laughs> Psalm 57, we'll start with our psalm this morning. Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy. I look to you for protection. I will hide beneath the shadow of your wings until the danger passes by. I cry out to God most high, to God who will fulfill his purpose for me. He will send help from heaven to rescue me, disgracing those who hound me. My God will send forth his unfailing love and faithfulness. I'm surrounded by fierce lions who greedily devour human prey, whose teeth pierce like spears and arrows, and whose tongues cut like swords. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. My enemies have set up a trap for me. I am weary from distress. They have dug a deep pit in my path, but they themselves have fallen into it. My heart is confident in you, O God. My heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. Wake up, my heart. Wake up, O lyre and harp. I will wake the dawn with my song. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your unfailing love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the highest heavens. May your glory shine over all the earth. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence this morning. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would flood this place and fill this place, Lord. Father, I thank you for this psalm where a man is hurting because of the people coming against him, but yet he cries out to you and he gives us an example that when we're hurting, we just cry out to you, Lord. We just cry out to you with more faith. Father, we're relying on you. We trust you. We will sing of your praises. Today, we will sing of your praises literally, Lord. So I pray that our praise to you is acceptable, pleasing, like a sweet aroma. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that you gave up your one and only son for each of us. And Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. We praise you, Jesus, for laying down your life, shedding your blood for our sins. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
While he's getting ready to sing this next song, I want to give you a little testimony about this song. This is my favorite song in the whole world. And some of you know this story, and some of you don't. If you've heard it, please listen again. In 2012, God calls me out of a career to pursue ministry. I quit my job in January of 2013, and two weeks later went on the mission field to Haiti. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Didn't know anything. And we walked literally into a place that had just had the most massive earthquake they'd ever had that destroyed their country. And you, many of you probably remember that. And the demonic activity was so real. It was the first time as a believer I had experienced true demonic activity. These people worshipped Satan that we went to see. I walked through a drum circle where they were worshiping Satan, and we had to walk through. They made us walk through the middle of them to get out, and a guy looked up at me, and he had solid white eyeballs. We went out into the country field one day, and we turned the corner to go witness to this village, and seven men showed up with machetes. To say my faith grew in that little short trip to Haiti <laughs> is an understatement. But our worship pastor said, I got one song. He went with us. I roomed with him. He said, I got one song we're going to play over and over because they know what demons are here. And they know what it's like for their mountains to shake because that's a mountain island. And that mountain had just literally shook. And the demons were running and fleeing as Christians came there delivering the gospel. I'm telling you that because this song means a lot to me. And I'm going to be honest with you. I know I'm not a good singer, and that's okay. But when I sing this song, I'm not singing to you guys or to Peyton. I'm singing to my father. And I want you to sing like you're singing to your father. I don't know how many more times I'm going to get to sing this song in this church. And if this is the last time, I'm going out with a bang, okay? So that's a warning for you guys that are new. Uh, it's a joyful noise to the Lord. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> so worship like your life depends on faith in Him to protect you.
All right, I'm going to need a volunteer to do communion this morning. And I got one. Can somebody help pass out communion so Miss Eliza can walk us through it? This is represent of the bread that um, his body shed it for us. So everyone just take a minute and um, think about um, how he, he did that. This represent of the blood he shedded for us. So, um, take a minute and um, 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 thank him for all that he's done for all of us. We get a hand clap for Miss Eliza. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to take communion, and I thank you for the work you're doing in our little ones' hearts, Lord. Thank you for Eliza's boldness to get up here and lead us through communion. And Father, I pray that you'll just grow her passion and desire to know more about you, Lord. She is going to be a leader for you, Father. So we thank you that we're getting to see it develop, and I thank you for the other children as we're seeing it develop in them too, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for this time that we can remember your death, burial, and resurrection. Without that, we're not here. So Jesus, we are thankful that you took on the beatings you took on, that you shed the blood you shed for our sins to be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good job, Eliza. All right, a few things to kind of run through, not really announcements, but just updates. Uh, first of all, I haven't done this in a while. We don't talk a lot about giving, but I wanted to make you aware of our ways to give in case you have forgotten or need to know. We have our giving box in the back that you can put cash or checks in. Checks will be payable to follow him with us. We can also, you can give on our website or the app, our app on the app store, followhimwithus.com slash give, or you can Venmo us. So, as you guys know, I've never been really good about talking about tithing. I tried it for a while this year, and it just is not my thing. But I did get a request from someone online <laughs> that I tell them how they can give. So, I'm trying to honor that. I want to give you guys an update. How many of you know what's been going on in Israel this week? Got a few. How many of you know that they did something that's never been done in history this week? <laughs> if you don't know, prepare to be entertained a little bit, and, and we never celebrate death, right? But there is a scriptural thing where God sent his army against the evil people that were against him. Hezbollah has been launching rockets. A few weeks ago, I told you guys they had launched 7,500 rockets since October. The number's now up to over 10,000. And again, I use the analogy of what if Canada shot one missile at us? We'd go crazy and obliterate them. But yet our country is not super supportive of Israel standing their ground. But I think we've been praying for them and praying for their safety and praying for their wisdom because we knew there was going to come a breaking point, and that kind of happened this week. So if you don't know, Israel was using cell phones to track down like the GPS coordinates of the Hezbollah leaders, and they were just picking them off like, and finally, Hezbollah said, this ain't working. Now, this goes back months ago. And they said, we're going to get these pagers. Any, raise your hand if you know what a pager is. Wow, most people do. <laughs> okay, that's surprising. <laughs> a pager was this little thing we used to wear on our side before cell phones. And I know for some of y'all, before cell phones was a time 
right, Monica, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> and we had these things called landlines. They had a cord. And they twisted up all the time. But someone, you, had, you could wear this pager, and they could call a number and send a number through the pager, and you got a page that said, call this number back. So it was like the first text message, call me, type thing. And you would go find a pay phone or a landline, and you would call them. Well, those haven't been around for a long time, but Hezbollah decided that's our best way of communicating because you can't track those. And then they also had these walkie-talkies. Well, somehow Israel found out they were going to order these, and Israel formed a fake company in Hungary to supply them through another company in Taiwan. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but our government and many other corrupt governments create shadow companies that really don't exist to funnel the money so you can't chase the money. Well, Israel knew they were going to do this, so Israel joined the chain. Israel sent them pagers and walkie-talkies that next to the batteries had explosives in them. And at a certain time on Tuesday, three to 4,000 people walking around in normal life just started exploding. And they weren't major, it was small bombs. It was enough to hurt them depending on where they were holding that pager. I won't get graphic on this, but it, it paged them so they would look at it, and the goal was they would look at it, and it would blow up in their face, and it damaged a lot of them eyes, hands. Some of them, they had them in their pockets. It damaged other things. Um, but it was kind of like a psychological warfare attack. Well, then the next day, the walkie-talkie started blowing up. Well, now that's kind of the red line, like Israel has said, game on. So as we speak, for the past couple of days, Israel has been bombing the mess out of Lebanon. This is a major escalation. While we don't want that to happen and we want peace for Jerusalem, as we've tried to teach you guys over the last couple of years, this is prophetic. This has to happen. God will protect his people. That I know. So I wanted to kind of update everyone. I mean, we've already got like a third of our Navy there. And we announced that Monday another, the USS Truman is shipping out. I think it's in Virginia. So I don't know exactly where it is, but it's going over there too. So we're going to have, I mean, like this is getting big. Um, so this is not it meant to scare anyone. The U.S. is going, please don't escalate. Please don't escalate. We have an election in November because we as Americans only think about ourselves, not you guys, but our country as a whole. It's all about us. Take on 10,000 rockets, but just don't interfere with our election process. Well, Israel said, no, we have to defend our people. So I'm going to pray. for. Actually, I'm going to ask Wendy to come up and pray for Israel. We need to continue to pray for Netanyahu and those people. We may or may not agree with their tactics or what they're doing. That's not the point. The point is we're praying for their safety. We're praying for their wisdom. It's over there. We're praying for God's will to be done as they fight. So we talk about this all the time, but one of our jobs is as believers is to pray for Israel. It says, bless Israel and you'll be blessed. Curse Israel and you'll be cursed. <laughs> so I want to be on the blessings end. Um, so let's let's just bow our heads and Lord Yeshua Jesus, we thank you for being our friend, our healer, our Lord, our Savior, our deliverer. And we pray for your people today, Lord. We pray for Israel. We pray, Father God, that you'll send warring angels in the natural realm and spiritual realm to bind up all unclean evil assignments coming against Israel, coming against the IDF, coming against all people that live in Israel, Netanyahu, all um, sergeants, all generals, Lord. I ask that you help them to fly underneath the enemy's radar in the mighty name of Yeshua, Jesus. I ask, Father God, that when they send those rockets, those things just dissipate in the air in Jesus' name. Um, it'll even be a sign to people that are not believers. How did that happen? We sent up 10 rockets, and we don't even know where they went, and they just dissipated in thin air. Because we believe in a mighty, supernatural God that does supernatural things. It's like when you parted the, the sea, and you allowed them to walk through it, and you swallowed up the enemy behind them. We're asking for you, Yeshua, Father God, 
to do that same thing. We know that you are still in um, the healing, delivering uh, ministry. You've never stopped. You've never stopped working. And so we thank you, Lord. We ask, Father God, that in this time, people that are um, in Hezbollah, Hamas, um, just anybody that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, we've been hearing of accounts of people coming to know you through dreams and visions. And um, we're asking for you to touch people that are in the evil, that are being blinded by the enemy, and they'll receive you as their Lord and Savior, drop down on their hands and knees. They'll tell other people about the visions and the things that you did to them when they didn't even know who you were. And so, Father God, we're asking, Father God, for you to touch those leaders that are doing the evil, and they don't even, some of them think that they're going to get some kind of reward after they do the evil they do, Lord, but I'm asking, Father God, for a miracle. And so, Lord, ask that you give each one of those IDF soldiers strength and energy to continue to fight and do what they're called to do. Netanyahu, give him wisdom and discernment beyond his years on the next steps to take, Lord, in the mighty name of Yeshua Jesus, Lord. I ask, Father God, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. And so we ask, Father God, for your supernatural protection and bring people into the kingdom in this day and time that don't know you as their savior in the mighty name of yeshua jesus we love you and all the glory is to you amen thank you wendy so i know that we're supposed to be getting back to our topic of did jesus go through that too and I know I took a detour off of that to talk about biblical conflict and how we truly love each other. And I know I promised that I was going to come back to, did Jesus go through that too? But this week we're not coming back to that because there's something more pressing to talk about. <laughs> I'm going to start out, I guess I should hand these out. Okay, we had a problem this week. Miss Kelly, who's not here, gave us a printer, and I'm so thankful for that. But I've already run out of toner, and I didn't know that till this morning. So I only have five copies. So I'm going to give these to the people less likely to do what I'm about to ask next. You can cut all this out of the camera later, Jeff. Y'all can. They don't read them. No. I know you deserve one because you take notes. This girl's taking notes because she said she wants to teach it later. All right, who wants the last two? All right. Javier raised his hand first. Can you share that with your mom? Y'all want to fight over this one? All right. Now, for those that didn't get a copy, I want you to get out your phones and go to our app. If you don't have our app, go to our website. I'm going to walk you through this. And you can do this if you got a piece of paper, too. If you go to our app, when you get to it, it's just kind of a black screen with a few sections. Click on Sermons. And the very first one says the coming holiday season. Click on that, and then kind of down at the bottom, there's a thing that says notes. Click on notes, and you have the notes, okay? If you didn't know that, that's available every Sunday <laughs> with the sermon. All right, but what if you don't have the app? Let's go to the website. And our internet's a little slow as we're doing this in real time. When you go to the website, the first thing you see is the book. Above that, there's three lines. Click on those three lines. It brings up a menu. Click on sermons. And the first one is the coming holiday season. And when you click on it, it looks a little different if you do it on the website. You scroll down and it has document. I don't know why they're different. And you can access it that way. Okay. 
That way, if you don't have a piece of paper, you lose your paper, you want to go back and listen later, I just want to make sure, I've walked through that before, but I want to make sure everybody knows how to get to that. Anybody got any questions on that? Okay. So I got two statements that I want to make, and I want to see what your first thoughts are, and I want you to be honest. My first statement, and maybe, well, if I were to say, we're about to enter October, right? Today's September 22nd. We're about to enter October, and that kicks off the holiday season for us in the United States. What's the first thing you think of? Thanksgiving. Thank you that you skipped Halloween. Thank you. Praise Jesus. She didn't do Halloween. Neither do y'all, do you? That's right. But that's the first thing we think of, October. It's, it's Halloween. I mean, look around. Wendy and I were out driving around yesterday, and people have skeletons hanging where their ferns normally would. I was mowing a guy's yard the other day, and I turned, and his neighbor, hidden up against the woods, had a 12-foot-tall skeleton, and I might as well have gotten a beeper blow up on my side. I jumped, and it was scary. But we think October's Halloween, November's Thanksgiving. At least Thanksgiving's a good one to be thankful because we're supposed to be thankful. Then we get into December's Christmas, and then January's New Year's, right? That's our first thoughts. Second statement. And as you probably know, we're going to come back to that first statement. Second statement, if I were to say we're about to enter a new season, what would you say? Yeah, today's the first day of fall, right? Yes, whoever asked, yes, today is the first day of fall. We're in global warming, though, so you won't feel it today. You won't feel it till December, probably. Sorry for the sarcasm. Both of those statements are completely correct. We're about to enter the holiday season. We'll skip Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, January, uh, New Year's. And it's correct that we are starting a new season today. But both of those are completely useless to us and to me today. Completely. Now, I don't want you to get upset with me if you think I'm trying to take away your pumpkin spice lattes. Chris, or your evil Halloween death decorations that no one in here is going to put up, or your awesome turkey dinner, or your selfish free gifts you get for Christmas. I know I'm trying to, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to stir a little bit on purpose here. Yes, sir. You can decorate as far as, as, far as fall goes. Yes, good question. <laughs> I'm just proud of you guys for, yes. But right when I say those things, that stirs a little bit like, oh, gosh, she's taking away all my holidays. Or are you excited that I'm about to talk to the fact, that I'm about to talk about the fact that we're about to enter the biblical fall season of holidays? And that we should be looking for a change of a God season. Yes, it's the first day of fall, and that's a change of a season. But is that what God meant when he said, look for the seasons? We're going to go into all that. And you guys, by your cheers, have been here. We've been here together long enough as a church. You know where I'm going. But maybe some of you don't know where I'm going, so you're going to learn today. But maybe most of us need a refresher. Because we have an issue as believers living in the 21st century and living in America. We are well-versed from birth on American holidays. We know them like the back of our hand. We are well-versed in the changing of seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. I can ask you, what's your favorite season? See, all different answers. Spring, thank you new life. Chris said winter, but he's mad at me because I asked him to give up his pumpkin spice latte. So <laughs> if you guys don't know, Chris is our bougie man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, we're interactive, so they'll make fun of me as I make fun of them. You can make fun of me. <laughs> it's all okay. <laughs> But how many of us, you know, we're well-versed in our American holidays, we're well-versed in the season changes, but how many of us can tell me the next biblical holiday besides Parker? Peyton's not in here. Ooh. 
I heard a couple things. What? We got one answer. Good answer, Monica. We're going to come back to that. Monica said Feast of Trumpets. Does anybody know when it is? Don't look it up on your, oh, you're, you're cheap. You're reading on the sheet. <laughs> Not the 28th. I'll tell you in a minute. I'm trying to draw attention and ask questions no one can answer, and Monica cheated. That's why we love you. <laughs> you had data. <laughs> Monica's smart. And I didn't pick up on her looking down. <laughs> huh? What'd you think of? Good job. Rosh Hashanah. Is that the same as Feast of Trumpets or different? Okay, we got stuff to learn today. But I'm proud. I got a couple of answers here. Yes. How many of you can remember the last biblical holiday? Don't look at your paper. Don't look, Gina. I'll see you. Got a Passover. That has happened, but it wasn't the last one. Yom Kippur is not the last one. It's still to come. Man, I'm, I'm okay. Now I know why we're supposed to teach on this today. All right. Um, how many of you know about a sign in the sky that's linked to one of these holidays? Or more than one. Sign in the sky that's already happened this year and another one that's going to happen this year. Oh, man, this is good. A lot of questions, a lot of tough questions. So here's the thing. If I ask the typical Christian, I'm not Christian bashing, but this is just our West, Western culture. If I say, start with January and give me every American holiday between January and December, we can rattle them off. And we won't even just get the major ones. You know, it's going to be like New Year's, Valentine's, St. Patrick's Day, Cinco de Mayo. Oh, I forgot Easter. Uh, Juneteenth, we'll throw that one in there. <laughs> Jeff slapped his face. July 4th, we have a dead gum holiday every month. I don't think we have one in August. Oh, I, for, I, forgot, I forgot Memorial Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day. I forgot Labor Day. Okay, yeah, we won't go there. My point is, if I ask you American, hol American holidays, the average Christian can rattle them off like that, right? But if I ask Christians, list off all the biblical holidays, what happens? Crickets. So there are seven major holidays. These are on your notes if you have the piece of paper. i got a few scriptures before we get deep into them. But I'm going to introduce them here, and we're going to come back. Seven major holidays or feasts on the biblical calendar. These are feasts that God said to observe. These are not all of the Jewish holidays. These are the seven prescribed feasts. Number one is Passover. Number two is unleavened bread. Number three is first fruits. Number four is Shavuot. I'm going through them quickly, and then we're going to break them down. Number five is Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah. They, some of them got multiple names. We'll go through that in a minute. Number six is Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Number seven is Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Shelters. Okay? So we got four feasts that we call Spring Feast, and then we have the final three feasts that we call Fall Feast. Right? And Jewish people have celebrated these feasts for they celebrate them every year. For They've done it for thousands of years. Yet most Christians in America not only don't know about them, they can't name them, but right now the average Christian is like, Jason, what's the point? We're, we're Gentiles. We're not Jews. What's the point? Why do we care? These are Jewish holidays. Don't apply to us, right? That's what the average Christian knows to say and will argue to say. So I want to make sure that we, all of us, understand these dates and understand that they're very, very, very important to us. They're extremely important to us. I'm going to prove it to you today. As Gentiles, and if you're a Jew, remember Peyton's still praying for that. We've got Jewish blood in us. As Gentiles or Jews, it's extremely important to us. The feasts, the festivals, these dates, 
They're important for that we understand what we're going through, what we're experiencing, but maybe as importantly or more importantly, what we should expect to happen next, okay? If we don't understand these feasts, then we're kind of clueless as to what to expect next. We're just getting up every day, trying to tell everybody we know about Jesus. That's a good thing. Trying to persevere through the bad stuff. That's a good thing. But we really don't know what's next. We're just waiting on Jesus to come back, whatever that looks like. And that's, those are all good things. But the seasons and the feast will tell us a lot more than just waking up and trying to go through the motions and wait for that day. Also, if we don't understand these feasts, not only are we going to be a little confused or maybe uneducated on what's going to happen next, it's going to be a little tough when we get to the next world. It's going to be a little confusing when we get to the new heaven, the new earth, and everybody's observing feasts that we didn't care about. So these feasts were laid out to the Hebrew people, yes, to the Jewish people, as we would know them now in Leviticus 23. They are instructed, and, and you can go read that. You can go read Leviticus 23 on your time. They're instructed to observe, the, the Hebrew people are instructed to observe these feasts each year forever as a permanent instruction from God. He didn't say, observe these feasts until the Messiah comes. Whether us as Gentiles believe the Messiah has come, Jesus, or the Jews that are still waiting on a Messiah, they're not going to quit celebrating when they think their Messiah is here or when they find out he really has already been here. God didn't say do them for a little while. He said do them forever as a permanent instruction. But again, these feasts were just for the Hebrew people, right? Part of the law of Moses. We got Jesus. We don't need that stuff, right? wrong today if you can't remember if you've never been taught if you just need a refresher we're going to talk through why these dates these feasts are crucial for us to understand as believers in jesus no matter if we're jew or gentile so what we've taught about before but to kind of get you back up to speed is that the life of jesus followed the spring feast exactly and it's not taught in my opinion it's not taught enough in church and, and I think hopefully we all know now that God is not a God of happenstance. He doesn't just, well, I think today I'm going to do this. It's been planned from the beginning. We were told in Scripture the end was planned in the beginning. His whole plan was laid out in the beginning. We may not understand it all, but we got a lot of Scripture to tell us, and some of it we're just ignoring. But God is a God of order. And if he did all the spring feast in order, we should expect him to do the fall feast in order. God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. God doesn't change. So he did everything orderly, and now we're just like, oh, well, I guess he'll do whatever he wants now. I expect, knowing God, that he's going to do things in an orderly fashion for the fall feast. And they are exactly going to coincide with the life of Jesus, just like the spring feast did. Huge impact, potentially, over the next week and a half to two weeks. As we dig into this today, and we're going to probably have to finish it next Sunday, I'm going to kind of step back and give you some scripture to preface the fall feast. Then I'm going to tell you why it matters. And I taught on this a few years ago. Peyton's taught on this each year. But let's start by kind of backing up a minute and talking about our American brains and how we think. We were formed out of a Western culture. If you don't know what that means, it means we are Greek-minded in our, think, our thoughts. Our country is very much modeled after the Greek culture and some sprinkles of the Roman culture. Now, a lot of people like to say that America is the new Jerusalem, whatever, the new Israel. We live our lives after a Greek culture. Look at our statues on every one of our government buildings. We have goddesses all over our Jesus-following nation. We have temples that represent things from Greek times, from ancient Greece. We are a very Western-minded people. Everything we think is Western-minded. We expect that something will happen once, and then it's done. It's not going to happen again. That's the way we think. Biblically, we Read something in the Bible, and we say, it's done, that's a piece of history, 
What's next? But as I've taught you, the Jewish people are continually thinking, when is it going to happen again? Everything is cyclical. It's going to happen again. But we're in America. We're the best society that's ever lived. We're the strongest nation. We're the richest nation. We're the smartest nation, and nobody can touch us, right? If we're to be honest, that's how we think as Americans. And when we have that kind of thinking, we've turned Jesus and our Father into some things they never were, and we miss a lot. So if we want to truly understand some important things about our Father and about what Jesus is going to do about our Savior, we've got to break out of this Western mindset, and it's hard. Because it's just like the American holidays. I can recite them because I've been taught them for 48 years. But it's harder for me to do the Jewish holidays that I've just been focusing on for four or five years. America is not the chosen country. Everybody get that? Americans are not the chosen race for God. It's children. Israel's the chosen country. Jerusalem is the chosen city. And the Jews are the chosen people. The way we need to stop and praise God is that we got grafted into that. We get to be a part of it. We need to praise God that we're grafted into his chosen race. We don't replace them, and a lot of Christians teach that. It's called replacement theology, that the church and the American church has replaced the Jewish nation. That is not scriptural. So first, we've got to get our mindset straight. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 through 11, that is on your sheets. History merely repeats itself. This is Solomon. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. This is that what, this is that Eastern Jewish mindset of it's happened once, it'll happen again. Verse 10, some people, sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past. So you're off the hook if you can't remember things. We don't remember what happened in the past. And in future generations, no one will remember what we're doing now. That's a sad statement, but that's kind of where we are. Christians are doing away with the Jewish past because they don't feel like it's important. And Solomon said that was going to happen. It's up to us to keep it going. It's up to us to keep telling the stories. It's up to us to see the history merely repeating itself. There's nothing new. It's all happened before. I want to give you an example. One of the Jewish times, not one of the seven feasts, but one of the Jewish things that we celebrate is Purim. Right? That's the story of Esther and Mordecai. No, Mordecai's yay. What's at the core of that story? A man named Haman. And he had one goal. What was his goal? Exterminate the Jewish people. A couple thousand years later, here comes a man named Hitler. What was his goal? Thank you, Parker. What was his goal? Exterminate the Jewish people. Our, our country, and if you were alive during that time, you probably looked at Hitler and said, this has got to be the end of Antichrist. This is the end of times. The Jews would have recognized, no, history is merely repeating itself. Time and time again, there had been men arise with an Antichrist spirit that tried to extinguish the Jews, and God didn't allow it to happen. Now, 80 years later, after Hitler, we got the leader of Iran, and he's got one goal, exterminate the Jews and America, because we're one of the only countries still supporting that nation. But my point is, history's repeating itself. The events are different. The players are different. The timing is different, but the same thing is happening over and over And now, unfortunately, we've got this Antichrist spirit that's present in the United States it's in our communities. Go look at college campuses. Protest against Jews. It's in our government. Just go listen to AOC talk. Don't listen too long, though. It'll make you dumb. But it's in our churches, too. And that's why this stuff's not talked about enough. Every time I post about praying for the Jews, I have Christians that come against me and say, those aren't God's chosen people. Those are fake Jews. I'm not going to entertain that discussion. Scripture says Jews will be brought back into their land, and that is happening as we speak. We are watching prophecy be fulfilled. 
I'm not going to buy into this anti-Semitism, this anti-Jewish rhetoric of they're the wrong people. That's between them and God. I'm watching Jews being restored to their nation. And by the way, Ezekiel 36, if I'm not mistaken, says that has to happen before the Messiah comes back. So we need to quit fighting over these aren't the right ones and be like, yes, we're the generation getting to watch this happen. Wendy mentioned this scripture just a few minutes ago when she prayed, but Genesis 12, 3. We've said this scripture so many times, especially in the last year. I will bless those who bless you. That's blessing Israel. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. Our translation say, curse those who curse you. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. All the families on earth, not some, not Jewish families, all the families on earth will be blessed through who? Israel. We should care about Israel. It's very important that we should understand and appreciate some Jewish things. Because if we don't, we're tempted to fall into this Antichrist spirit without even realizing it. And when you fall into that Antichrist spirit and you go against the Jews, you just put yourself in God's crosshairs according to that scripture laid out early on in the Bible. All the while, we're just great American Christians and we're better than the Jewish people because we recognize Jesus. Don't get that thought. Don't let that thought go in your head. Be thankful they rejected Jesus so we got him. Anti-Semitism around the world is at an all-time high. It was kind of hidden until October of 7th of last year, and now it's out for everyone to see. So we should expect it, and we should be ready to reject that Antichrist mentality. Simple scripture, bless those who bless Israel, curse those who curse Israel. And if you remember, that word bless means you get more of. So God is saying, if you give more of yourself to my people, Israel, I give more of myself to you. If you pull back and don't give yourself to them, I will pull back. Where do you want to be? You want more of God? Or do you want God pulling back from you? This is serious. You get more of God if you get more of yourself to his people. So I believe that as we take time to understand the Jewish traditions, we're giving more of ourselves to them. As we give time to practice the feast, we're giving more of our time to his people. We're blessing them. We get blessed. We pray for them. We're giving more of ourselves to them. And what do we get in return? More of God, more of his blessing. If you despise the Jews and you don't pray for them, you think they're the fake Rothschild Jews or whatever that conspiracy is, you think everything they do is wrong and they didn't get it right with Jesus, God just removes himself from you, and that's not where you want to be. So we, you guys know this, but in case there's somebody watching that has our, our Savior Jesus is a Jewish man, Yeshua. We are grafted as Gentiles into the family of the Jews through the blood of that Jewish man, Yeshua, Jesus. We live forever in the new Jerusalem one day, according to Revelations, with who? That Jewish man, Jesus, a Jewish city with a Jewish Savior. We need to understand this if we want more of God. Now, somebody can tell you, you don't have to do this stuff, and they're absolutely right. We don't have to. I'm just telling you, if you do it, you get more of God. I didn't tell you you had to do it. But if somebody tells you it's wrong, I'm not going to go there because God removes himself. So I hope that alone tells you why you should care. But I haven't even gotten to the fall feast and why you should care about the fall feast. I want more of God. I want you to all get more of God. That's our purpose. So I hope now you're going to care more about learning about the feast and holidays that God described, prescribed for the Jewish people. As I said, there's seven feasts celebrated by the Jewish people each year. And, and again, there's more than seven things celebrated. Purim is an example. Jewish people celebrate Purim, not one of the seven feasts. Hanukkah, celebrated, not one of the Jewish feasts. So there's more than these things that are celebrated. These are the seven things that God said do forever. Seven feasts, four in the spring, three in the fall. Spring feast again, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, Shavuot, fall feast, feast of trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, sorry, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. 
This is where it gets important for us. Each of these feasts has a yearly significance for God's people, and that's more historical. But each of these feasts has a messianic significance. It has a Jesus significance to us, to all of us. And that's what we're going to focus on. So remember, Passover is the time that they remember being delivered out of Egypt. The miracles that were done, the Red Sea parting, they were delivered from slavery. God did this deliverance ultimately through the blood of a lamb that was slain. Put that lamb's blood on your doorpost. That's how the death angel passed over your house. So every time they celebrate Passover, the Jews are looking backwards to that time of miracles and deliverance, right? But then Jesus comes on the scene, and he is the ultimate Passover lamb, we're told. His blood was shed, so we don't have to sacrifice those animals every time we do something wrong. And guess when Jesus died? Passover. So we have this feast that's celebrated yearly, and Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb, was slain on that day. Is that a coincidence? Thank you. The next, the answer was no for those on camera. The next feast is unleavened bread. It starts immediately after Passover. Leaven represents sin. So they were taking sin out of the leaven out of the bread. It represents taking sin out. What did Jesus do? He took on our sins. He had no sin. He is the unleavened bread. When was Jesus buried? On unleavened bread. Coincidence? No. The next festival is first fruits, where people brought the best of their harvest to God, the first, the best. When did Jesus arise from the dead? First fruits. God is giving us his best, his one and only son. Again, coincidence? No. Fifty days later, exactly the next feast is Shavuot. Anybody remember what happened 50 days after Jesus? Beth, death, burial, resurrection. Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes. We got the Greek word Pentecost, the Hebrew word Shavuot. We all know Pentecost, but how many of us know Shavuot? So 50 days later, the Holy Spirit comes as the gift that Jesus promised to leave behind exactly on the feast of Shavuot. Do you see what I'm saying now? Jesus' life, death, Burial, resurrection, Holy Spirit coming followed the first four feasts exactly. That's either an incredible coincidence or the perfect timing of God. So you have it on your handout, so you'll remember, because we've taught on this before, Passover, Jesus dies in leavened bread. He's buried without sin. First fruits, he's resurrected, because those three, those three festivals are boom, boom, boom. Then Shavu, 50 days later, Holy Spirit comes, the church is started, and we call that Pentecost. So then what happens for the Jews? You wait. You wait through the summer months. You wait several months of the summer, and there's no feast. And you look forward to the fall feast to come. The Jewish people like to party. These feasts are fun. They get time off work. They eat. They drink. They're happy. Again, something we probably can't even compare with as Americans now because we get up and we work and we eat and we go to bed. And we get up and we work and we eat and we go to bed. And we just try to survive through the week. They're going through the summer, no feasts, no festivals, looking forward to the fall. Then we get the fall feast, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So if the spring feast happened 100% in order on the day, would we not expect God to do the same for the fall feast? Thank you, Monica. Yes. The next fall feast, Rosh Hashanah, also called the Feast of Trumpets. How does that tie to Jesus? Got a good answer. I personally believe, through Scripture, it's referring to the time that Jesus will return. Then Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is also called the Day of Atonement. It's the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. It's the day of judgment. Doesn't that sound like something Jesus has to do after he returns? He has to judge the whole world? Then we have Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, 
That was to celebrate the time that God came and tabernacled with the Israelites in the desert, in the wilderness. And we know that we're going to live on a new heaven, new earth, or on the new earth with God and Jesus forever. He's going to come tabernacle with us. You get the point? We should look at the fall feast and say the feast of trumpets, Jesus' return. The day of atonement, Yom Kippur, is the day of judgment. And then Sukkot is the time that the new earth is created and we live with our Savior, with our Father forever. That should be exciting. But what about this time between the spring feast and the fall feast? Summer. Because that's been going on if you're going on this messianic calendar for 2,000 years. But doesn't that make sense? Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, sends the Holy Spirit. Now we have what we call the church age. Now we're supposed to be out bringing people to Jesus. There's a time for that. God has a perfect planned time for that. Some time has to pass. Then Jesus comes back. Are you getting this? Are you following this? We're in the summer right now, so to speak. We're in that time of waiting. And we don't know if it's this year. We don't know if it's 200 years from now. We don't know if it's 500 years from now, but we're in that summertime of waiting. And this should be exciting if you're starting to get the point. Because the next feast will symbolize when Jesus comes back. The first four were fulfilled exactly to the day of celebration. We expect the fifth one to happen at the same time. So why is this exciting today? Because Rosh Hashanah starts on October 2nd in a week and a half. <laughs> Do I need to start over so you get this? Or are you guys getting it? It's the first of the fall feast. It's the next one to be fulfilled in the life of Jesus. It's marked by his return, and it starts in less than two weeks, October 2nd at Israel's sundown. Remember, it's not our sundown. It's Israel's sundown. Uh, it's about 11 a.m. or noon our time, depending on if you're watching this in Central or Eastern time. But each year at this time of Rosh Hashanah, we should get excited. Like, this could be the year. And for those that say, but Jesus said you don't know the day or the hour. Guess what? Rosh Hashanah goes over two days. So you could still be Rosh Hashanah and you don't know the day or the year or the time. But God also tells us we should know the signs and the seasons. We should know the times. I'm going to get into that more in a second. Each year we should get excited. This could be the year. We're supposed to be living every day in the expectation that Jesus Christ is ready to come back today to get us. And I could be wrong in everything I'm teaching you, and he can come back tomorrow, and it's not Rosh Hashanah. I'm just telling you, if I follow his pattern, his pattern is that it will happen on Rosh Hashanah. So this is a time that we need to be in great expectation. It can be this year. So we should use this as a time of reflection. Am I where I want to be when Jesus comes back? Because also as Americans, we put off everything till tomorrow. I'm going to start eating healthier on October 1st. Fresh start. Ah, that didn't work. I'll start on January 1st, and we'll call it a uh, New Year's resolution. Thank you, Pete. You don't believe in it. But that's what we do. We put off what we need to do today for tomorrow. We procrastinate. But I want this time of year to be the time that I'm going, God, what do I need to work on? Where am I with you, Jesus? Am I where I need to be when you return? This isn't a works-based perfection thing. This is, is there any sin? Is there any pride? Is there any unforgiveness? Any rebellion that I need to work on? I'm just naming a few. Because when Jesus shows up, I don't want to be going with Jesus. I was going to deal with that forgiveness tomorrow. I want to be ready. I want you guys to be ready. He's coming back in a week and a half. I didn't say he was. If he is, are you ready? Now, next week, we're going to get into what does that return look like? Is it a rapture? Is it the second coming? Are those the same or different events? Is it a pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture? Monica, I know I promised you rapture this week, but I'm sorry. God evolved it into next week. Okay, good for that. You got something to look forward to. You already know the answer. <laughs> yeah. 
But we have to understand these feasts so we can be expectant and not be surprised. When Jesus died on Passover, all of his disciples would have said, of course he did. He's the Passover lamb. Of course he did. When Jesus was buried on unleavened bread, his disciples would have said, of course he was buried on unleavened bread. He's the one without sin. When he arose on first fruits, they would have said, of course he did. And Pentecost wasn't some random date out there that the Holy Spirit just decided to show up. They would have been expecting something big to happen. And when the Holy Spirit showed up, brought fire into the camp, and they started the church, and it grew by 3,000, they would have said, of course it did. This is the day of Shavuot. So now, as his followers, 2,000 years later, we're sitting here with no clue what could happen in a week and a half, for the most part, as a church. I'm not talking about you guys. You now know, or you've been reminded. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, I'm going to dabble a little bit into Scripture we're going to get into next week. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. It's a shofar. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. So let's be honest. If we hear a shout from Jesus coming down from the clouds, and then we hear the voice of an archangel, and we hear some trumpets blowing up in outer space, what are we going to do? We're going to freak out, hide under a desk. (laughs) That's the answer. We should know this sequence. God expects us to know when these things happen. We should go, that's the return of Jesus. And we should be on our knees worshiping him as he comes. Parker said he's going to run outside. There's not a big hole in the roof, so he didn't go through the roof. (laughs) A little precursor to next week's rapture discussion, in case you don't know where I stand on it. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, Paul says, But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. How many of you like secrets? It's born in us. We love secrets. I've here, I got a secret for you. Are you excited? Paul gives it to us right here. It's a secret. He says, We're not going to all die. Praise God. But we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of the eye when the trumpet, sorry, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to life forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. So we're told here twice by Paul that the return of Jesus corresponds to what? The sound of a trumpet. What is Rosh Hashanah? The Feast of Trumpets. Getting it? On the Feast of Trumpets, 99 blasts of the shofar are sounded, and then a final one, which is the longest one to make 100, is the last blast. And what did Paul say? On that final blast, when the last trumpet is blown. You start hearing some trumpets blowing in the skies, (laughs) get on your knees. Just wait for the 100th one, that last one. We're going to have a little, it's not just going to be like, Tim LaHaye's left behind where we're driving down the road and all of a sudden, boom, we're out of the car and the car hits something. It may happen like that, but you're going to have some events happen that are going to say, hey, it's here. It's here. So pull over, get out on your knees and worship, okay? (laughs) It's exciting. It's exciting to know this could be a week and a half away. We're going to cover all this more next week. But it's interesting, Paul doesn't say, he, 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 on one scripture he says those who are dead will rise, but on the other one he says those who are asleep in the ground. They're asleep in the ground. Anybody else know what Rosh Hashanah and Feast of Trumpets is called? Yom Teruah. Anybody know what Yom Teruah means? Day of the Awakening Blast. Paul's telling us. There's going to be this day, and this trumpet's going to blow, and the dead are going to come out. The sleep in the ground are going to come out, and then we're going to go with them. Rapture. <coughs> we'll get into that next week. <laughs> but if we don't understand the history of the Jewish people, the history of these feasts, and why it matters, we're going to all miss all this. Guess what? Here's the good news. You still get to be a part of it. You're just surprised by it. You don't know what's going on. You still get to be a part of it. If you don't care about the feast, you don't get excluded from it. Hopefully. (laughs) I guess it depends on how far you go with anti-Semitism there. 
That's a different discussion for a different day. But you took it to be a part of it. I just don't want you to be surprised. I want you to have something to look forward to. And I want you to think about this. For most of us, not all of us, but most of us, we get excited every year for our birthday, right? We'll sing happy birthday to Peyton later. His birthday is this week. But don't we get excited? Okay, for you people, and I won't look at anyone that might be a little older, was there a time in your life that every year you, got, you look forward to your birthday? Why? You got free stuff. You got money. You got gifts. So every year you're like, it's my birthday. Monica has a birthday month. There are like three of them. <laughs> See? <laughs> we look forward to our birthday. But then our birthday comes and goes and there's a little bit of letdown. Yeah, I got some cool stuff. But man, it's a whole nother year. But what happens the next year on your birthday? You get excited again? So what I'm getting at is I'm going to get excited that Jesus could return in a week and a half on October 2nd through the 4th. But if he doesn't, I'm probably going to feel a little bit let down, just to be honest with you. But you know what? I'm going to get excited again next year. And I'm going to get excited again the year after that. And I'm going to get excited again. And one day, I'm either going to die and go into the ground and sleep, or I'm going to get sucked up out of here after the people of y'all that are asleep get sucked out of here. But I'm going to be expectant every year when Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of the, of the Awakening Blast happens. Does that make sense? We should get excited every year because prophetically this is the next thing on the calendar. There's some other things that may have to happen around wars and things like that, but it's a little bit confusing. We may be in those. But the next major prophetic thing on the Jesus calendar is his return. We don't have to wait on anything else. We're waiting on his return, and that's the next fall feast. Then 10 days after Rosh Hashanah, we have Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement, holiest day of the Jewish calendar. That's when judgment comes. It's also when the blinders are removed. That's key. Because when judgment comes, sounds a lot like the judgment of Jesus at the end of the tribulation. And blinders being removed sounds a lot like the Jews going, ha, huh, we were wrong. Blinders off. That's our Messiah. Then the final feast is Sukkot, tabernacles, Jesus comes tabernacled with them, lived with them in the wilderness, and he's promised to do that for us. That's a great promise. We get taken up. There is judgment, and then we get to live forever with him in paradise. One last thing before we end today. We started by talking about the fall holidays. We've covered that. Anybody got any questions on those? But I want to hit that other thing I mentioned real quickly, the seasons. Today is the first day of fall. It's a new season. But is that what God means when he says seasons? No. In Genesis 1.14, it says, Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. So the sun, moon, and stars, they're there to tell us when the year starts, right? They're there to tell us when the day starts and ends. And God wants us to know when winter becomes spring, spring becomes summer, summer becomes fall, fall becomes winter? No. The Hebrew word for seasons is, help me out, Peyton, moed, moedim, thank you. And it means the appointed time. The sun, moon, and stars are put there to show us the appointed times, not it's summer going to fall today. And, and, and we can know a sign in the heavens is coming, and we can be talked about, and sometimes we don't even know what it means until we look backwards on it and see some major event tied to it. Um, Mark Bilt is really good at doing that. Red moons, the blood moons, all that stuff. But each festival that God has prescribed is an appointed time. The signs in the sky show the appointed time. You getting the connection? On April 8th, 2024, there was a solar eclipse that you could see in the North, in North America. We couldn't because it was cloudy that day. Anybody remember that? And everybody said, what does that mean on God's prophetic time clock? And Christians said, it's an X from the last one in 2017. It's God's judgment on America. It's all this stuff. And all these Christians made predictions and nothing happened. 
It was going to go across seven cities named Babylon. Then they did a little bit of research and found out that was a little bit of a twist of the truth. Or Nineveh. It was Nineveh's, not Babylon's. But April 8th was a solar eclipse, and there's one more coming up this year. You will not be able to see it in America. April 8th coincided. All right, I got to step back for a minute. You guys remember, our calendar is different than the Jewish calendar. Our, our calendar starts January to December. We are based off the sun. Theirs is based off a combination of sun and moon. Theirs doesn't line up. That's why Rosh Hashanah is in October this year. with September of last year. That's why Passover and Easter were a month apart when we didn't celebrate Easter, but we celebrated Passover this year. The Jewish people have two new years. I mean, let's be honest. The Jewish people are severely complicated people. One new year is the religious new year, and that happens on the first day of the first religious month. One new year is the civil new year that happens on Rosh Hashanah. Guess what April 8th was of 2024 when the first eclipse happened? It was the first day of their religious year. Guess when the second eclipse is coming this year on Rosh Hashanah? At exactly the time Rosh Hashanah starts, Israel time, there will be an eclipse. It's a sign in the sky. We had a sign in the sky for their Religious New Year, now we have a sign in the sky for the civil New Year. It gets better. Anybody know of a comet coming into view soon? There's a comet, and they couldn't make it easy and call it Halley's Comet like we had back in the 80s or the whatever the one was in 2020. This one has to have a complicated name like C2024-A394 or something like that. It's going to come into the Earth's orbit. It's going to kind of orbit a little bit and then shoot out. Guess when the day is it's the most visible to the naked eye in the United States or the world. October 2nd. Like, you can't make this stuff up. We've had two eclipses, and we had this comet, all signs in the sky, all coinciding with Jewish holidays. And we got Christians out there trying to predict what God's judgment's going to be with all this stuff instead of saying God's just giving us signs in the sky. It's interesting, this second eclipse, I'm going a little... Religious conspiracy theory here, I guess. Um, the second one is the ring of fire. It's where the sun won't complete, I mean, the moon won't completely blot out the sun. You'll be able to see the edge of the sun around the moon. That's called the ring of fire. Anybody remember what God promised? He would never flood the earth again, but he would destroy the earth by fire. <laughs> Half of America's on fire right now. Half of Israel's on fire right now in Lebanon. I, I don't know if that's coincidence. I'm just saying it's there. What are the odds that Rosh Hashanah starts on October 2nd, same day as the second eclipse, same day as the comet, signs in the skies marking the appointed times? It's just fascinating. It's not like I'm expecting you to do anything with that. It's just fascinating. Next week, we're going to dig more into what does Rosh Hashanah mean, the return of Jesus. I'm going to give you a little preface. Christians get all bent out of shape over, is there a rapture? No, there's the second coming of Jesus. I am going to try to walk you through Scripture to show that they are two separate events. Jesus was born. Jesus lived 33 plus years and then he died. And we call it the first coming of Jesus. It, it, it wasn't one event. It, it was multiple events over 30 something years. But when we get to the end, we get all caught up that his second coming has to be a one time event. What if it's a combination of events? That's where we're going to go next week. We're going to talk about more scripture as to whether we are supposed to endure the wrath of God, the tribulation. The timing of all this. Is the thousand year reign literal or figurative? We're going to dig into that as best I can with scripture. Today's factual. Today is factual. Feast, Jesus' timeline lines up. Next week's going to be more of how Jason interprets scripture. But I'm going to give you scripture. It's not going to be an opinion without giving you a scripture. But I referenced this last week or two weeks ago. If you disagree with me, it's okay. It's okay. We can agree to disagree. The important thing is that we should all be looking forward to the return of Jesus, and it could happen very quickly. You with me? Father, thank you for giving us the signs. Thank you for giving us the scripture. Thank you that we have a time we can be excited about your son's return. Father, we get excited about a concert. We get excited about a football team. We get excited about a birthday. 
Why can't we get excited about your son's return like we do for those things and more? So, Father, help us to approach this with your mindset. Whether that goes against what we've been taught or not, what is true biblically your mindset, that we would live expectantly for your son to return, that we would know the signs and we would know the seasons, that we would be aware, that we would be ready. If it doesn't happen when we think that we would just get ready to get excited again next year. And if I got it all wrong, Lord, and you just want to show up tomorrow, come on. As the disciples would tell each other, is it Maranatha? They would just walk around, Maranatha. They were just expecting, Lord Jesus, come. That's what that word means. Lord Jesus, come soon. So whether I've got it right or I've got it wrong, it doesn't matter. Father, let us live in expectation for your son Jesus to return. And thank you for letting us be a part of your family, Father. Amen. the Lord bless and keep you. May His grace and His face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Okay.